Right, so I think we get cracking. And just a quick introduction. Um, uh, this is part of the project we have, the OTLA project, to spread the use of digital tools in the college. Um, and Scott's going to talk extensively about what they do at Basingstoke, where they're quite a way ahead of us in the game here, they're quite a way down the line of the way they've been developing digital processes and digital tools in their practice. But interestingly, I think, um, and the great thing about today is that, you know, this contact that I, the, and the relationship we started uh, uh, between me and Scott it happened through using a Google community, uh, through an initial conversation about, I can't even remember what it was about. Do you remember what it was about? Archer um, Avatar, it's Kez, wasn't it, from the 70s? Was it? And I, I think I'll, like this guy, well, okay. <laughs> and media, Google, yeah. and that was the reason I reached out to you. Yeah. It seemed like you were so, one of my kind. Uh, we're, we're, we're both people who are really invested in the idea of developing collaborative practice and and, where, and seeing where that could take us, and seeing very much uh, that we're part of a world where these opportunities are so vast and so potent that uh, just to see where we can go with this, and we've already had a really fruitful discussion with my team this morning about how we can develop uh, more links and, and get our students more in, in, in contact with students in Basingstoke, how potentially film students could collaborate on making films together in different colleges, and, and, and also how art students could maybe uh, work in peer review remotely and, and the potentials that they can develop. But actually, what's what's going to be more, much more interesting for you guys is <coughs> looking at the, the wider program, the extraordinary things they've done in both Ben Stoke, and um, it's kind of a bit mind-boggling to me sometimes. And that kind of development that they've used there, and how they transformed pretty much everything, I think, with certain hurdles, resistance, yeah, uh, along the way. But um, I'm not going to talk any longer. So I'll hand over to Scott. But we also have Holly here, who's um, a learning facilitator. So someone who started as an apprentice has been given a role as a learning facilitator, specifically more to do with working in digital practice. Yes, yeah. yeah. um, to help them develop the digital tools and skills they can. Right. So, so we've the session and it comes to me. Good. So, but anyway, I've said to Scott, really, he's going to do a brief introduction, but re be most useful if he gets some feedback from you about more questions and answers and things he can show you. He's got three separate presentations that he's, been, that he's brought along, but I think it'd be useful, more useful to have it a bit more informal. But So have a think about what, what you think might be useful from your point of view. Right, that's enough of me. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. It's LA's Tuesday coming. So my name's Scott Hayden. I'm a digital innovation specialist at Basingstoke College of Technology. Um, now, I contacted Jim months ago. We started sharing. I just for years I've been frustrated by the lack of sort of um, innovation in my institution. So I reached out on Twitter and other things to reach out to other like-minded people who wanted to push things forward, and that's what this all stems from, really. In fact, I'm standing here today doing this, trying to get two colleges collaborating. This makes my heart sing. It's wonderful. So hopefully, end of today we'll have different collaborative projects across all subject areas. That's what I really want. Um, now we've got three options really. You can choose from three different presentations that may be um, best for you. So we've got the first one. This one here is about <clears throat> how we started, how we went from nothing to something that's quite useful, and um, in terms of being nationally sort of patted on the head for doing good digital things. That's our journey over the last two years. Our journey using blended learning, as it were. Um, we've also got. This one here, which is our best of sort of compilation of the best blended learning sessions that we've done this academic year, the top 10. Third option is this here, all that collaboration and all the collaborative ways that we can get our students working with each other. What's the general read on the room and what you would like me to present, really? Because I'm pretty loose about whatever you want me to present, really. Any preference? Can we go people in different backgrounds here? I want to be led by you, really. Sorry. I'd go for the second one. Is this the best blended learning? Yeah. Cool, no problem at all. We can always flip, go, <laughs> always go backwards and forwards if we need to, that's no problem at all. Okay. We've got a bit of issues here. No, it doesn't seem to be. It seems to have conked out here. Oh, maybe it's just. 
Uh, will this work? Will that mass work? Thank you. Okay, so this is um, this academic year, I suppose. So much like yourselves, we've um, embraced G Suite as a college. Um, so we went from using Moodle uh, for a couple of years. I've been teaching 10 years, by the way. This academic year marks 10 years I've been teaching as a creative media production lecturer. I also teach teachers in the evenings as well. In the last couple of years, I've started to teach teachers about digital things. Um, this academic year, across every single course, level two, level three, and next year, level one as well, every single course has one hour of timetable blended learning. That is, they come into our learning zones, where there's Chromebooks, Chrome bases, and a facilitator, much like our colleague, will guide the students, whether it be level two also, or level three engineering, or level two arts, through their hour blended learning task. That is posting Google Classroom, students log in and do their task, which goes towards their criteria or their program of study. So 10% of every single course is done through blended learning now, and it's my job as the manager of the digital team to help create ideas and interesting, innovative ways of doing that. So at the end of the academic year, it's been our first year, it hasn't been smooth by any stretch, but we've managed to get to a stage where we know how to do this well now. So. We gave awards out to the staff who did the best activities. So we saw activities such as this one here, Michael Oliver, Oliver from Computer Science, posting Google Classroom tasks that were nice and succinct, easily understandable by the actual students. He created copies of the assignment brief for each of his students. He set up classrooms and made the tasks relevant. That was the feedback we had from all students. That's all well and good, but it's a whizzy technological digital app we're using, but what's the relevance of this? Why do I care about this? My teacher isn't here in this room and you sent me to a digital classroom. Why am I doing this? We found all the third party bought in software. Students sniffed that out and felt cheated almost by it. it. Wasn't their teacher's fingerprints on it anymore. If they could see that Michael, their teacher, his avatar was there at the top so they could see it come directly from him, not some fancy American dude on YouTube talking generically about the subject, but Michael, it was in their actual physical lesson. They come into a blended learning session and Michael's task relates directly on from their physical learning in the classroom, truly blending the traditional and the digital. The reason it worked so well with the students, they saw it link up to the criteria. He communicated really well with Holly and the rest of the digital team about how we can improve things. When the students were responding well to the task, he was setting them. He kept us informed as well about quirks and nuances of his group. So that collaboration between the digital team and the curriculum team meant it works quite well for these guys. Michael also used Google Sheets really well as a tracker. So every time they did a task, the facilitators could put the information live into Google Sheets and they could see instantly live, oh, that, that much closer to the assessment deadline, that much closer to getting this qualification. Seeing that populate live gamified the experience for them. They could see the relevance of it because it literally related to their criteria. In Google Sheets, we helped them to create an algorithm and a formula that generated this progress bar that moved up every single time they submitted work in Google Classroom. The students could see what they did directly led to results. They could see that join. It wasn't a separate thing, which is why it was so successful. That progress sheet was so valuable. Michael also popped down to the blended learning zones as well. This was crucial. In fact, it wasn't just some separate entity where you go and do something online. Michael came down and walked around going, guys, you all right? Everyone okay? Talking to the facilitators in front of them so they could see it all joined up together. Wendy, one of our learning facilitators, um, said that that's part of the reason it worked so well. They could see it all blended and joined together. It wasn't some bolted on um, solution. The tracking grids, that was the main thing for these guys, seeing that incremental progress. Animal management did really well towards the end of the year. Didn't go so well at the beginning of the year, but the second half of the year, um, they started to use it really well. Like humorous, irreverent sort of titles, quite playful, but it always related to their criteria. They were making infographics and things like picture chart and Canva, and they were actually creating resources that went towards their criteria. It wasn't just a time-filling exercise. Matthew Martin, the main animal management lecturers, tired of the paper um, portfolios that were submitted. They 
they wanted to prepare them for the future. So they started making websites. They started actually making resources that would help them to be more employable and to promote them online beyond their course, getting them match fit, as it were, for that interviewer, for their apprenticeship, for their university, whatever it might be. Each student animal management made an animal portfolio. So clear directions, here's what it needed to do. Extension tasks as well, really useful for people who fly ahead. Some links, that's what it needed to do, were given to them in their Google Classroom. And each student had to build a website using Wix or Weebly. They put photographs from the farm and the um, hand rearing activities they did from their Google Drive, uploaded it into their website. So animal management students are building websites, drag and drop, easy to build websites, which now they've left the course, they've got with them as part of their portfolio, which makes them eminently more employable than their peers and their rivals, as it were, and they go for those jobs. We found feedback already from a couple of them saying that having that website uh, has been really useful in helping them get to the last stages of university apprenticeship interviews. So it instantly differentiates them, giving them that digital reputation as well, helps them to stand out. They were really reluctant at first, they were, animal management, but they saw the benefit of it at the end. In fact, some of the feedback from them was really useful about blended learning in general. They said that if we had an online learning hour in our timetable, we'd nip off to town. If we have to be there in the actual room, timetable, we'll come in and we'll do the work. So they were quite mature and open about the fact that if we were just told we've got our online learning, we'd just muck about, we'd just waste the time. If you've got to register in with their badge, say hello to Holly, Holly's making sure they're okay as well, making sure they turn in the work by the end of the hour, progress was made as a result of that. In music, uh, Paul Body's been fantastic this year. He uses Facebook as well as Google Apps to reach out to his students. He's found that Facebook works best for them, making a closed group and having them actually communicate with him that way. He makes screencasts about him using the software, which is really useful. So for people to actually revisit and replay Paul showing them how to use different approaches and tools and extensions helps them to learn in a differentiated way, rather than putting their hand up and saying, Paul, do you mind going through that again, mate? Because I didn't get it. No one wants, no one wants to be that student, but Paul enabled it so they could actually revise, rewind, replay a digital version of Paul in that screencasted video, which he shared with them in the Facebook group. He also regularly posts work experience opportunities in the Facebook group and invites guest speakers into the Facebook group to actually share tips and tricks as well. I think Paul does is visible on Facebook as well for employers and industry to actually see that he's training these professionals. His screencasts he shares pretty much every week. So people can access it on their device or in Google Classroom in the actual blended learning zone as well. Clear tasks, really succinct to the point, here's what you need to do. And more importantly, here's why it matters. If you can I say why it matters, then the students will just go, well, it's not being marked. Why should I, why should I care? We had that from a lot of people this year. You're seeing the best of. There have many instances this year whereby students said, well, it doesn't relate to criteria. It's not useful, so why am I going to do it? After a year of doing it, we've realised which ones work well, which ones don't work well. We presented these in teacher briefings. Um, every Tuesday, 8.30 to 8.45, we shared the best practice, as it were, across the college to all the staff. And we shared tips and tricks about things they can do with their Google Drive as well. That's what this slide is here. So we're constantly drip feeding ideas and tips and best practice back to the staff every Tuesday. 8.30 to 8.45, just sharing best practice, celebrating people in areas that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be doing this well, actually doing incredibly well. So, we also did this. We, um, I gave post-it notes to every single member of staff and asked them to write down one thing they wanted to have created for them. My digital team and I, we created one of these things for them. I'm currently in the process of creating these things for staff our digital team which consists of myself i've got eight student digital leaders who i train up so they're paid now by the college five hours a week originally they were just volunteers probably was a digital leader so my eight digital leaders who help me train staff go into staff rooms and on inset days train up staff as well two learning technology apprentices sky and charlie and our learning facilitators six of whom we have and Holly is one of. 
our digital team are constantly flowing in the background, making sure we're there to support the staff. So we gave them post it, asked them to say what they wanted, to order it up, and then we created it for them and gave it to the staff members. So constantly like a support mechanism is how we see ourselves for all the staff at VCAR. So here's some more examples of good practice. Um, sports, most popular area in the college this year in terms of blended learning. By some distance, actually. It's not 76 percent um, saw it relevant and useful in their course, which is quite a bit higher than most other areas in our first year. Darrell and Jamie created tasks that were relevant, tied into their criteria, really useful. Um, use their time effectively in these sessions. They were reflecting on their practice in the gym. They were making videos of themselves, doing weightlifting exercises, and editing them in their blended learning areas, recording voiceovers of them doing the weightlifting exercises, saying about their technique, how they can improve it, making websites as well. Um, Pre-visualization and um, analysis of sports clips of themselves on the field engaging in sports. Really useful approach to blended learning. She was really responded well to it. I used Wii Video, the free online video editor, to drag and drop clips from their Google Drive and to make video clips of them in doing their activities and then recording voiceovers of how it went. That then went towards their outcomes, their criteria. These sports guys who have done anything like this before were on their phones recording videos of each other, phones blended learning and doing this. It was the best session of this year, I think, actually. It was surprising to see them engage with the way they did. They communicate and collaborate with us directly. We're, they work alongside us as part of the team, and that's part of the reason it went well, I think. They're really keen on virtual reality at the moment. We're working with them using Google Cardboard for next year to so do some virtual reality videos for 17-18. Trudy Murray, um, in particular, health and social care is incredibly um, effective this year and her use of different technology for pretty much every week she tried something different she was just open-minded sometimes it didn't work but the students the goodwill that it initiated from her students the fact that Trudy was trying new things alongside them meant that they went along with her she came down to the blended learning zones as well when she could and was always keen to work with us to try out new things to try out new ideas what was most effective was the way they she allows students to choose the tool that best suited the task. Rather than saying, you're going to do an essay, if a student said, I want to do an infographic, or I want to do it as a podcast, or I want to do it as a video, then she allowed them to do it. She completely differentiated her approach and allowed them to pick the tool that best suited them. True differentiation. So she'd give them a task like this, and she'd give them a list of possible ways they could do it, and allow them a choice. You could use one of these tools, or if you can find something better, brilliant. She's like co-designing the curriculum with her students. So when she gets the criteria back, it doesn't matter how they do it. She's gone to work for edXL. Is edXL she gone to work for now? Um, because uh, her work was IV, EV, SV so successfully, in the way she uses differentiated approaches that they've sort of um, headhunted her. And it's activities like this that led to that. She was so led by the students, co-designing with them completely open-minded and willing to explore new ways and have students say to her, this is really cool for you, look at this app, we can do something with this maybe. She's been fantastic this year, she'll be missed, she will, I'm sure did. Fiona in childcare, um, she used the session really well because they would finish the lesson with Fiona and then go into their blended learning zone and they'd carry on the task from Fiona's lesson. So Fiona, at the end of the lesson, wouldn't wrap things up or check the objectives she set them another objective, and then they're going to do that objective independently in their blended learning session. So as I'm sure you sort of noticed, in, everyone's using this hour very differently. It's whatever suits, completely bespoke and tailor-made to whatever the course needs. In some weeks, it might be a deadline week. Therefore, they'll do their assignment in that week. Some weeks, it might be a case of them actually learning something new. Whatever suits the class really is what we're led by. In terms of the presentation tasks, they used Google Slides and they collaborated live on their Google Slides and rehearsed it. Video of each other practicing their presentations before they went into the actual presentation to do it and be assessed. So they used it to practice, to rehearse, to get match fit for when they actually were being assessed. 
having that time in our tables are all inward facing circle like tables to talk to their peers to practice to feed it out before they actually went into the assessment it was quite useful for them to actually practice Fiona always said what criteria it related to that was really effective so the students can argue a bit well this is that outcome if I don't do it here I'm making homework for myself I've got to use this hour effectively so some of the last ones in art in particular Rebecca would give her students copies of Google Slides and ask them to fill in like a gapped handout the actual responses at times she would relate her tasks to criteria and to whatever project they were currently doing. She was always led by what industry wanted. So if the students were wanting to be graphic designers, she would make mention of that in her post. She would talk about what's expected in the industry and this is the rationale as to why you should do this. It isn't just us trying to be all whizzy and keep up to date with you young kids and your apps. This is what industry demands. By framing it in that way, she got a lot of buy-in from her students who saw it as, well, that's one of I want to get a job out of this, so I better learn these skills. It's so making a website to promote their work, making an Instagram account to promote their work. Tasks like this that the students just saw as well, that is going to help me, so I need to do this. They create websites as like a hub for all their best work to promote themselves beyond the course, to people beyond their classroom. She made it essential to their progress as to why they should do it. Adina, as well, came down to her sessions, open-minded approach, was positive. And because she was positive about it, her students reflected that. If teachers, and there have been many teachers this year, have been reluctant, reticent to engage with digital learning, then the students just follow. It mirrors immediately. If they see their teachers sort of roll their eyes at the idea of having to do anything new, the students just instantly repeat that. If you're like a Dina and you're open-minded and positive about it, the students have embraced it. And that 10% of their course, which is that one hour a week, is used effectively and meaningfully. Joe from Science, really clear instructions, well laid out, regularly contacts and collaborates with the digital team. It's constantly related to the criteria. You can use the topics section on Google Classroom to say what outcome it relates to using hashtags, which is very easy for the students to ping straight to and from whatever task it is they've been asked to do. Really well organized, that's what Joe's work was, which is what made it resonate with the students so much. So that's sort of like the first part, I suppose, this sort of series of three presentations I've got for you today, really, but I want to be led by you, really, as to what um, questions you have. Any questions at all before I decide what next ones to sort of share with you? Anything at all you want to, I want to talk at you for too long is what I'm trying to say here. Was the initiation of this whole project you're doing based around delivering the brand of learning or was it, was it something that started before that? It's all before that really. I mean, uh, if I sort of flip to this one, I suppose, it all started um, this whole, this, everything I'm sort of discussing really, because um, about two a half years ago, we used Moodle. E confidence around the college was really low, and we were woefully out of step with what industry and university was asking for. Just woefully out of step with it. I'm a media teacher, and I'm very geeky about teaching, and I love new ways of finding um, meaningful pedagogy. I was doing things that were being, I was getting nice feedback for, and the college asked me to sort of help things out. Really, at the beginning. We had low in confidence among the staff from our staff survey. We used Moodle, which the students hated. No one used it. Sound familiar? Um, no digital support at all for staff. For the first time in the history of education, our learners have no more about the toolkit than we do as practitioners, arguably. And that gulf freaks people out. That hurt the egos of staff so much. So we needed to bridge that gap. Nowhere to hold sessions to help people learn things, no time, as everyone says. The demands were that students were already using these things without us. They were already doing it. And we didn't have the time to learn these things. We needed to, again, make that connection and bridge the gap. Industry were demanding we need more collaborative, creative, communicative tasks to 
prepare them for industry. A more personalized pedagogy being led in a bespoke on demand manner uh, by what students wanted because outside of lessons they were learning using tools that we were not using in the lesson. They were coming to college for a break from learning, if anything, some students were saying, which is really upsetting, but that's what we heard from the student feedback. Um, no time, no resources. This is all from the staff survey in 2014-15. Um, resistance to change, fear of the unknown. What change is what I'm about to show you, I suppose. What we made the time to train staff. That word time, and what we gave to the staff, we explained that things were going to change and we gave them the time to do that. In August 2015, after teaching media for seven, eight years full time, I was given one day remission to train students. I made this little ropey video uh, using Screen Pastify uh, of me um, saying I want a team of digital leaders. I saw this thing in Finland um, whereby these innovative schools created digital leaders. That is, they got their student champions and used their knowledge to actually help them to train staff. I love that. And, and in the States as well, they were doing digital leaders as well. So I thought, I'd love to do that. I've got like loads of media students to be brilliant at this. So I asked a YouTube video of me saying, right, I'm Scott, I'm gonna be doing this every Wednesday, who's in? And I tweeted it out there and got like 72 responses on the Google form. People, and I interviewed loads of people and whittled it down. So the body was one of these people. Um, student digital leaders who are gonna be like my Trojan horses going into staff rooms and helping to train people. So if it's just a techie man talking about techie things, it becomes like white noise. If it's bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, brilliant students, difficult to say to them, no, the old way is best. And just to carry on doing it the way you've always done it. If your student's saying, look, we're doing this without you. This is, this is the future. It's difficult to deny that, really. So this little video I put online, I gave students a free lunch, gave them enrichment hours, work experience hours, and an academic reference. And every Wednesday I trained up a few of them and they became my digital leaders. It all started to my deputy principal, Jackie, who gave me that one day a week to do this, I suppose. Without that one day a week, nothing would have changed. Well, not certainly not as quick. One day a week, I created the team, built and trained them and we discovered new ways of using technology and ways they were already learning. I was just absorbing from them. On the inset day, which only a couple of months later, rather than having everybody in the lecture theatre and some person ironically talking at them for about half a day um, about here's the future of education, here's what you need to do, and get everyone pumped up and doing that sub stand up comedy routine that many inset day speakers do, we just got them to go out and make something. So we did five to ten minutes of introduction saying, right, like, we're the digital team and we're here to help you. We went into the ILT suite, as it was then known as, and we gave them a menu of different things they wanted to learn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever it might be. And we gave them two hours to create a tool, gave them the time that they requested. Every single member of the staff created something. And by the end of that two hours, all the digital leaders floating around, helping them, being there available for them, um, the mood was really upbeat and positive. Everyone felt like, oh, I made a bit of progress today. I've now got the contact details of these guys. I feel I've got a bit of support. Did that in the morning and it went really nicely. And in the afternoon, this fellow came in, one of the flow tag pioneers, Bob Harrison, um, a brilliant man, um, former principal, currently works at Toshiba, um, a big sort of um, change agent in education in terms of speaking to the DfE and speaking to the government about the fact that industry needs this, education needs to catch up, or we're going to be woefully out of step. He came in, even though, and sort of um, was a bit harsher than me. I'm quite a hippie, laid back sort of guy. He came in and leant forward into people and screamed in their faces about, this is happening now. With or without you, this is happening. He terrified people, I think. We needed that. Me being all um, you know, quite laid back about things is made, made a bit of a dent that this guy coming in and giving the credibility and the gravitas of um, someone with 30 years of experience worn on his face going, look, this is happening. Stop polishing the china on the Titanic. Do it now, 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 now. It's just electric. Brilliant. And um, as the objectives we had at the beginning of the day, by the way, for the um, each staff member making a digital resource, 
second half of the day was just him talking to us about things, how they need to change now. That really, really had a powerful impact, I think. After this insert day, the college invested in the Wi-Fi, and that's the main investment, really. It's the one thing we need to invest in. Um, kind of a pipe, as it were, coming into the college for double the speed Wi-Fi. Digital leaders went on to train staff individually in teams throughout the academic year, going into staff rooms, floating around, being omnipresent, constantly there, not just a one-off gimmick we wheeled out for inset day, constant presence through social media and other things as well. Time was going to be provided for inset days to learn new skills. That was the big thing they all asked for. Inset days were a waste of time, people were saying. Having someone talk at them for hours and hours and hours, want to actually learn something, make something, get better. We were searching and found a Moodle alternative G Suite. Stuff wanted that. And we changed and clarified some social media rules because that was a little bit unclear amongst our staff as well. So this is what people said was needed after the first ever insert day. This is what informed the way we moved forward. The Wi Fi upgrade was the most important thing, followed, well, no apologies. Training was the most important thing to staff, followed by the Wi Fi. These are the things we addressed instantly. The second inset day happened a few months later in January, and the teachers who learned from the first inset day, where well, they all learned and created a digital resource, they then taught their peers. So, for example, Vanessa learned about the presentation software eMaze, 3D zooming one, on the first inset day. She then did a drop in session for other staff members to come and learn eMaze. Jim learned about Padlet on the first inset day with us, so Jim ran a session on Padlet. Staff members walked around to these different, eight different sessions, dropped in and learned something new, being led by their peers. All the while the digital leaders were buzzing around making sure each of these sessions was supported. So the second inset day, all the staff who learned from the first inset day shared their learning, fostering that sense of we're all helping each other to share and get better here. A series of workshops was quite well received. Um, in May 2016, Ofsted came in and said things were going all right, um, which was a nice turnaround considering the original e-confidence survey being as awful as it was. In fact, the students were driving this. It was student digital leaders. Co-designing with them, that was the big thing. The fact that it was no longer just technology geeks talking about things that only they do in isolation with their students, it was everyone. Yousef from the Warwickshire Group came in and spoke to us from an SMT perspective about how G Suite could be used to save money, to be free, to initiate collaboration and creativity amongst all subject areas. That was really useful as well, because I can talk from a teaching and learning perspective, but I'm not a member of SMT. And him coming and talk about it made everybody else go, maybe there's something in this. Maybe we need to maybe look at this Google thing. On the third inset day in July 2016, we trialled Google Classroom. We created Google Classroom for them and had, had them actually play around with it for the first time. So sort of quite a positive response as to how effective a tool it could be, because that's all it ever is. We're not evangelical about any of the tools we use, it's only what best helps the students. They all could see use and benefit from using this tool. They all pretty much unanimously disliked Moodle. So we embraced G Suite based on this inset day. We created a task in Google Classroom, gave them one minute win videos. We recorded a little one minute screencasted videos of us explaining, here's how you add a resource in Google Classroom. Here's how you do an assignment in Google Classroom. Here's how you add, an, add a teacher. We asked them to pick a level, intermediate, guru or beginner, and to do this little task and turn it in by the end of that one hour inset day task. From that, we've got all this information in a Google form at the end, finding out about the needs and what people wanted. This classroom was available all year, people to go back to and learn from as and when they wanted to. In addition to that, we were about just floating around making sure people were okay. So the feedback from the staff really helped them guide, guide us as to what needed to improve and what they wanted in particular, what does to target people. This is a bit of a theme really, a constant feedback loop in terms of finding out what students or staff want and then improving, never being done, that growth mindset approach of constantly getting better. This academic year, 
to go back to why I jumped on to this in the first place from Jim, the driver behind um, this academic year has been blended learning. So in truth, for this hour of blended learning this year, and there was all that before it, this academic year, one hour of timetable blended learning has been the norm across every single course. The team is my, myself, um, my line manager is Mark Breeden, we sit under the teaching and learning department, that's what we focus on, we are led by the pedagogy, that is the most important thing, always led by the subject specialist, they are the experts, we simply support them. Our facilitators, Holly is now a learning technologist stroke facilitator to give her her proper title, as is young Will. So Will and Holly were digital leaders. They've been promoted from within to be members of our team. Wendy was on the library before. Her role has evolved into being a learning facilitator. If you're watching this and thinking, where's the budget come from? Library, really, no one's using the library. The team evolved. That's pretty much how it happened, to be honest with you. Facilitators such as Zoe, who was in learner support, Poppy, who was also a digital leader, Regina, who was an assessor at the college, and Sam, who was actually a student last year, while also being a learning facilitator. He showed exceptional maturity, so we employed him as a facilitator. They were in charge of our learning zones. Students came in and worked on their tasks with the help of their facilitators. Charlie and Sky are brilliant learning technology apprentices. Um, they work with me closely to actually enhance digital across curriculum areas. Our digital leaders. So their role is to go out to every staff room and to work in one-to-ones with staff. What we found is the emotional intelligence and the empathy of digital leaders is far more important than their technological skills. I was consciously trying to get a coding guy, a video guy, a photography person to cover all my bases. It didn't work that way. The emotional intelligence of them was somewhat more important. Kindness, patience, understanding, to not intimidate the already fragile egos of teachers. To go up to them and say, do you want your help? If you've got someone who knows everything and comes across like so, hasn't got the patience or understanding to go through what a tweet is slowly, in an uncondescending way, then can't be a digital leader. We've got to be patient, calm, understanding, and like helping above all else. Secondly, comes the ability to do these digital things. What's most important is kindness and patience. That's the most important in any member of our team. Being patient to the fact that the egos are bruised with staff right now. We need to be delicate with that. So for the first time, they are a little bit out of step, and it's our job to bridge that gap. Any, any success is down to digital leaders, stuck the students, being led by them, being guided by them, their expertise. We made a YouTube channel, loads of one minute wins, which I'm happy to share. Uh, how to do different things, how to undo sent emails, how to switch between your Google and your Outlook accounts, how to migrate to Google Drive, how to contact people quickly, how to do hangouts, little one minute videos. So staff can watch them on the go, Click the subtitles on if they want, put on your headphones and learn something as and when they want. It's that bespoke on demand CPD. So by giving these to staff, we found that people were actually accessing them and working to actually learn as and when they wanted. So we put subtitles on each of them as well, so people who didn't have headphones could access them as and when they wanted. So making video tutorials has been quite useful in terms of um, digitizing ourselves to make ourselves more available and on demand for staff as and when they want help. Infographics, Holly is a graphic designer as well, so she's made lovely posters and infographics in the STEM faculty classroom, um, staff room. They love these. They're printed up on every wall, these are. How to actually do things like social media and what use they are. Always framing it in the way like, this helps people learn. It isn't just whizzy and cool. This is just the way people access their knowledge. Again, we can share these if you're interested, by all means. Um, just creating graphics, um, infographics. I know Jim and I were discussing that earlier on. But students help them to create them as well, to help show and teach each other as to how these tools help them to learn. 
using social media as well, whether it be our Twitter accounts, whether it be our Facebook, and constantly promoting and engaging with people around the world, not just the UK, we're looking at Finland, Scandinavia, and the United States in particular as the best practitioners in the world and learning from them the whole time. Our Learning Technology Apprentices, Sky, she was published on the TES back in October, um, talking about her experiences. Um, Charlie's built our website. Our website auto opens on the second tab when you log into any computer. So it instantly opens up, Peacock Digital, video tutorials, resources, and live chat as well. So if you're at your desk and you're struggling, you can just live chat with us straight away because the tab also opens on every single computer. So what we found this year, what's most sort of, in terms of reflecting as we've been doing as a team over the last couple of weeks, quite hard on ourselves as a team really. And we feel like even though we've made a dent, we're by no means there. We, Got to, we want to make every single session meaningful for every single learner. It's been a lot better, better sense from learners like in automotive who haven't quite cracked it yet. Their teachers have only just started to see the relevance of blended learning. They thought it was a gimmick, a fad that they could ignore and it would go away, but it's not going anywhere. Digital learning is going to happen in every single course, whether it be FE, HE from this year on. Learners need to see the relevance and the urgency of it, otherwise they won't do it. They just won't do it. It's good products on the market you can buy in, but if it comes from their, their teachers directly, it's got their fingerprints or a, a vlog or a video of them talking or a podcast of their teacher doing it, they're 10 times more likely to engage with it. Learners have to see the point. It needs to tie to their progress as well. And learners need to be spoken to and collaborated with. I think, again, it, that word ego comes up time and time again and with good reason. Many staff are reluctant to admit they need help. Um, that's where the digital leaders come in. So we found that they open up more to the digital leaders than they do to me or my peers, because opening up to me, one of their peers, is like admitting they are behind. Opening up to the student digital leaders, that's what's facilitated any change or success that we've had. These are sort of our tips and advice for you. All these presentations will be available, and I've shared it with Jim, and Jim will be, I'm sure, more than happy to share with any of you. We're not precious about anything we've created at all. We're happy to share anything that we've created with you um, at any point. Main reason for today is to sort of set up this um, collaborative sort of relationship between our colleges, really. We've got a relationship with Sheffield and Gloucester, and we want to do the same here in Bryson by having our subject specialists collaborate with your subject specialists. So I've made it, well, Holly made a simple graphic actually to demonstrate the actual process from July 2015 through to July 2017, two years almost to the day, um, to show that even though Jim kindly said that we're doing a white right at the beginning of this little presentation, um, it's not much difference at all really. It's a couple of little things need to fall into place and you'll be with us in no time. We've got everything lined up here from what I've seen today. Okay, so any questions or anything that I can sort of, I want to be led by you really. I feel we're just talking at you for long periods of time. I don't do that in teaching anymore, do you? You don't talk in long periods of time anymore. Um, anything I can help with at all? Sorry. It's, yeah, just a, maybe it's a specific thing or not. I don't know, but obviously you've got um, Twitter and Facebook and things like that, and then you've got Google Classroom. What's the sort of it, sort of uh, compatibility like? I mean, do you advise them that you that, that you use all that? I mean, I mean, I use Google Classroom, for example. But I'm aware there's a lot of benefits in terms of Facebook. But I'm, I'm also slightly aware of it's interesting to see that you, you can find the, um, the sort of the, the, the means or the rules for using it. Mm. Do you need that and Google and Google Drive to think? I mean, or I Google mean, Classroom. I mean. It, it, it's um, led by the students with really. music guys tended to like face Facebook quite right. well. Um, but you're right, classroom does the job, really, does it? I think that it's Facebook sort of does function. completely. Yeah. Um, so, but, but then it's closed, though, isn't it? You can't have that. That's the thing. Well, Facebook, I mean, the way we've used it, just to go to an example of how we use Facebook. Um, so, the Facebook um, has its benefits over classroom for these reasons, I think, actually. So, we've used Facebook for groups. Um, so, for example, I'm making a group for my students to connect with 
former students who are now at university to talk about advice as to how to get to university. Um, good for consolidating and expanding lectures, but so is Google Classroom really for sharing resources in. But what we found Facebook doesn't, which Google Classroom doesn't do, is it allows us to reach out beyond the falls of the college to industry connections and to advertise what students are doing publicly, which serves as advertising for the courses, marketing for the courses, mm -hmm. public services who go and do an army based event, live streaming it, put it on Facebook, and future students, 14, 15 year olds, see that and think, that looks all right. I'm going to go and do that course. Because they're advertising constantly what they're doing. And industry connections see it, potential apprenticeship providers, and that helps us to advertise and promote our courses. So in terms of differentiating Google Classroom from Facebook, I think it's industry connections. What's also been useful is having groups for cross-college projects. It's something I'm really keen to do with you today, really. Now, when the SNAP election was announced, our students were talking about it. For the first time in my 10 years of teaching, students seemed more engaged about politics than ever before. I found that they were writing these incredibly lengthy comments on Facebook, longer than any essay I've ever seen from any of them. <laughs> and they were talking about these things. Mm -hmm. um, I made a Facebook debate group. Um, what you're about to see also play, hopefully, is um, a week's activity in the Facebook debate group. I simply made a closed Facebook group, added 25, 30 students to it who I know like critical thinking and know like politics and I know really care about these sort of things. Added them all to it and they added their mates who added their mates and it grew to 218 members in about four months. Every couple of weeks I would give a juicy topic like is Trump the next Hitler, um, is feminism um, um, an antiquated term, Just be provocative, post something and have the students debate and argue. But I found after two months of me posting prompts, they were posting before I could get a chance to. So they were posting images, videos, memes, articles and then just arguing, arguing, but responsibly, professionally and in accordance with the code of conduct that I wrote and put at the very top. If any Facebook group you make, there's a code of conduct. Same rules apply as they do in any classroom. Be nice, be respectful, otherwise disciplinary procedures will be followed. Sorry. Did you, did you moderate that? Yes. Did you ask any of those students to moderate or just suggest I found they self-pleased after a while and they were messaging me going, Scott, have you seen this post here? And they, they commented and said, don't ruin this for us. And college, colleges, um, who was it? Reading College were joined in with us and our raising Stoke students and they were commenting and it gets a little bit my, my school's better than your school at times but it's all in good jest. Um, we found that they want to be respectful and professional. They want the space to do that and be commended for it to practice these new critical thinking skills and I would like and comment and prompt little Socratic little questions but we found that my learning technology apprentices helped to moderate it, but for the most part, completely fine. Anybody swore, even in, a, even in context, which I don't mind, really, you can swear, you know, I don't really like that. I don't swear that much, but in an outburst of passion, they were going, please, no, no naughty language here. Oh, well, mate, swear. <laughs> I wouldn't even say that, you know, but it's just quite nice to see them to say that to each other. Bizarre. This happened, so this debate group, um, led over into the real life world where they wanted to have a real life debate. So we hired out the lecture theatre, we filmed it, um, and yeah, they actually had a real life debate which we then live streamed as well, which is quite nice. So in terms of Facebook, we have different closed groups for how to use virtual reality. There's those of educators around the UK that have been added to that. UK FE chat, which is brilliant. Every Thursday, 9 p.m. on Twitter, the best FE practitioners in the UK sharing, getting better. Can't recommend that enough. Um, University advice for students. I did all my students into that so they can ask people older than them tips and advice that I've forgotten about. And just groups for my students. I have classrooms for each um, class. I also have a Facebook group as well. And um, that way I can just post other things in there that I wouldn't post in Google Classroom. But you're right, you could probably use just Classroom to be honest with you. Sorry. Um, in our understanding, we have lots of dyslexic students that would be scared to send this by now. Process. Really? You found evidence of that. That's interesting. So, in terms of, um, we in creative subjects, we tend to um, have quite a few dyslexic learners as well who are somewhat reticent to articulate in the written format. What we found with tasks such as um, written based activities, and with their reluctance to do so, is we differentiate 
for them by doing uh, live streaming uh, tasks, which has been quite useful for some of them, so they get a chance to articulate their response as a podcast or a, a vlog. Um, some people don't want to engage in social media, regardless of their ability to command the written word. We found that by giving the opportunity to embrace live streaming vlogs and podcasts as ways to submit evidence, um, it allows them a voice to do so. Uh, for example, we do live streaming at the college quite a bit this year in particular. Um, here's a guest lecturer beaming into the classroom. Um, we've been doing that, Jim and I have been doing that with each other's students this year, being guest lecturers for each other's students. Um, Sky, my learning technology apprentice, being beamed into a public services lesson to solve a problem there via Hangouts. We do Periscope, so my students, uh, Chris was dyslexic, um, didn't like writing it at all, but the guy could speak, you know, he was so a um, beautiful command of language, um, and I'm very articulate, and he chose to verbalise his responses in any debate we had on Periscope. Some people prefer to use just Twitter, but some people prefer to use Periscope. What's Periscope, sorry? Apologies, Periscope is a live streaming tool. There's me there, live streaming. So by pressing the Periscope app, I can live stream video to the internet of my students debating and talking, or promoting an event, for example. So by using Periscope, I found for our critical thinking discussions, this was really useful for debates and analysis. It's pretty good. Rather than just the same two or three students talking in your class, in an echo chamber of their mates, if you use live streaming, and Periscope in particular, you can ask them about, for example, feminism, it's quite hot topic, so I thought, well this game development class is just a bunch of 20 white straight dudes talking about white straight dude things, let's get some other perspectives. So hashtag ATO debates what we used, across the ocean debates. I live streamed, these guys saying, hey feminism, what is it to you? And they were talking. Some people didn't want to be on camera, so they tweeted instead. I had the choice though, they could either go on camera or they could tweet, it's up to them entirely. My media class responded to the game development students, the art students responded to them, and then what's more is a lecturer in America called Beth Sanders saw what we were doing and I invited her students to get involved as well. Um, Malcolm, a game development student, again, um, struggles with written tasks, not dyslexic, but close to it's fair to say. He chose to verbalise his responses um, while seven hours later, what we posted on Periscope was picked up by Beth's students in Birmingham, Alabama, who, like a message in a bottle, saw the video of my students talking about feminism, and they went, hang on a minute, we see things differently here, and they then responded. And then the next day, we come into class, opening up our message in a bottle, and go, no, actually, here's how it is, and back and forth, back and forth, it was electric. But the most fun I've had in the classroom in years. Um, the students loved it. And it, that was great assessment evidence as well for some of our students who had the chance to verbalise and join in debates that they wouldn't have done had it been just the written word. I mean, it's a key thing there as well, uh, Scott, that just kind of crops up throughout the day is, is you know, you're talking there about how people are engaged with these debates in a whole variety of ways, which suits them, and that's a common thing that I today in my discussions earlier, is that the technology isn't that one technology was brilliant, it's just that there's such a diversity of technologies that, that means that we can differentiate so much at every different stage of the students, and that's whether, whether it's how they're learning or how they're presenting their work, and that's, that's been part of our big success this year, is, is particularly in offering differentiated outcomes, so if you have to, you, have, you know, with the, the students need to demonstrate knowledge as such and such, if you do this as an essay, do as an infographic or a video, a presentation. So we offer them all these different outcomes, and it becomes easier and easier to do that and to try and them. So in the classroom, not everyone, you know, this year in our, our second year students, we had one thing that was prescribed at one point where they all had to write this and everything else they had, they had differentiated outcomes. <laughs> I think your use of technology here is really exemplary in that, you know. Some people are scared of Facebook, some people are scared of having their face visible, some people are, don't want to be writing all the time. So you're offering a, a forum that people can engage in it in all kinds of different ways, which is, you know, you know which, is, which is amazing. I hope so, mate. Um, just, we have different strokes for different folks, you know, just trying to, just, whatever works, you know, being led by them. And Twitter is quite popular amongst students, um, particularly 
media and um, teaching students and um, public services used it a bit this year as well, and business as well. Like, as a starter activity, if they're coming to the room and we have a hashtag at the top, or like a basing site college of technology, hence the prefix BCOT. Um, so BCOT, Trump, BCOT, politics, BCOT, um, film, whatever the topic is, we can just attach that prefix to. That helps to filter through all the tweets pertaining to that discussion or topic. It's a great way to demonstrate digital literacy, communication skills. The students tend to check each other's syntax and grammar, so it's English embedded as well. Get them to tweet in less than two minutes in 140 characters. That's good maths embedded as well as ICT skills. You can use something like Twitter form or Tweet Beam, and it houses and displays live the tweets coming through on the screen. So when it comes to my lesson, there's always a provocative question on the screen. And they can choose to live stream themselves saying it if they don't want to write it. And many of my dyslexic learners do do that. Um, or they can just respond. So the Grenfell Tower, unfortunately, that's eerily reminiscent of it just there. Mm -hmm. And we did a um, discussion about it. Um, do the conservatives care about working class people? Something really provocative like that. It's like, blah, blah, blah. They were going for it. But some of them just going like, get the camera on me, Scott. Right, here's how it is. And they were just going for it. Mm -hmm. uh, before the lesson had even started, and all on the tag. Uh, Beacon Tower, I think it was, they were debating. And then we can actually put that tag anywhere across the college and any student can get involved. What I really want to do is to have debates like this cross college between Brighton and Basingstoke, Sheffield, Gloucester on particular topics. Um, it's really useful in the classroom as well. You can then take the tweets that come through on the screen. Because when you ask directed questions in the class, it takes ages going around one by one while they're getting bored, waiting for their turn. It's, if you do it like this, they like 30 at once, all engaged, responding, and it gives you the chance then to go, right, Matthew, why do you think that, mate? Why do you think that? Sky disagrees with you. Sky, why do you say that? And it comes alive quick as well. It's quite nice. Do they do this on their phone? Yes. Yeah. When they come in, um, or they use, they log on, it takes ages to log in, unless you're using Chromebooks. So we tend to do it that way. You can ask quick polls as well, um, while um, displaying the tweets on the screen. Asked about voting recently, that got particularly heated. Quite a lot of UKIP lovers and raising stuff, it turns out. Um, uh, really, um, um, Manel in um, Barcelona, let's go back to um, differentiating people who don't like writing so much. Um, an art um, history lecturer in Barcelona, I tweeted on the hashtag EdTech, so anybody fancy debating and collaborating with my students? He said, yep, yeah, let's do it. And I said, can we set up an activity that sort of transcends language, really? Um, so he said, okay, let's do this um, one whereby we can contrast and juxtapose images from history to modern day images and how the same iconography reoccurs throughout history. And students in Spain and in Basingstoke were sharing images that show how certain patterns repeat themselves. And even though they couldn't speak the same language, they were collaborating. They're doing another one in September, which I'd love you guys to get involved with, telling a story in three images be quite fun. Force the students to think creatively about how you can tell a story in just three images, great for film students as well. So in terms of another tool that might be useful, Snapchat's been used quite effectively in automotive this year in lessons whereby students have actually create Snapchat stories to demonstrate their process and their learning in a workshop session. So Bradley and Saif here were documenting their process and the progress and their peers were commenting on the Snapchat store going, no, that's not how you do it, mate. Here's how you do it. And they were correcting each other and building on each other's learning. It was brilliant. And they downloaded the video files, a bit of evidence, which they turned in via Google Classroom. So something like Snapchat I was a bit wary of, but this story facility, I think is quite nice because they're literally showing their learning throughout the day and like a mini vlog almost. I think Instagram's really good for that as well, actually in terms of building um, portfolio um, evidence. Quickly go to Instagram, and I'll come back to LinkedIn. Instagram then, so you can make little one minute video clips on Instagram um, of your students showing their learning. It might be them as a team talking about something, it might be them showing them understand a bit of terminology, it might be them literally showing what they've drawn, sketched, thought about. That one minute video can then be commented on underneath by their peers, by their teacher, they can document their evidence through photographs if they prefer. We found that this really encouraged good peer reflection and collaborative sharing of their practice as well. Quick question about all the social media. Do you, 
you get the students to create new accounts when yes. they use existing ones. Yes, they make new accounts when they start. Their digital reputation is the most important thing to us as the digital team. We're currently in the process of writing a digital induction for all new members of the college. Um, so they learn about digital reputation, focusing on the positives, not the negatives. Focusing on how if you use digital correctly, it will help you throughout your life. Um, if never focusing on the negatives, not going, you know, don't do sexting, don't be mean, don't be negative, don't cyber bully. That's the way we always frame it. Um, we need to be positive about it and show them if you use this well, this is going to help you get a job. If you have a website, a blog, or positive social media, you'll be employable. Focusing, teaching that from the get-go is what we try to do. So they make new Twitter accounts, new LinkedIn, new Instagram, and they get given a new Google account, much like your guys do. What new ones, what would, would like a college, when you say new ones, you mean they just create a completely brand new one? Uh, they they use their Google. college email address typically, right. that's right. Okay. So if they've got an Instagram account, they want to keep that separate, that's fine. But our, our aim is that by the end of the course, there'll be no difference between the professional and the personal. They often create separate ones because at school there's been no sort of training as such as to why this is useful. So they come to us and they often, after the induction, realise that, yeah, I should maybe get rid of the old account and start something new. They start building a professional digital reputation from their first lesson with us. That's what we try to do. The art students in particular, we use a portfolio based approach to using Instagram to show their process and to make them employable. Um, that's been really effective for art guys this year. Do they keep their accounts, their email addresses and things when after they leave the college? They often swap out the email for another email by that point, yeah. yeah. Um, often it's a case of just for neatness, they use their college one for all their new accounts. That's right. So Scott, you know you said before about the code of conduct. Yes. Will you, will you be sharing that with us? Absolutely. Yeah. Quite handy. I'm ha more than happy to. In relation to social media or in relation yeah, to the Facebook groups? Both. Absolutely fine with me. If you ask Jim, I'll be happy to communicate anything you need by all means. Um, we use Hangouts every day um, in our digital team in particular. Um, in terms of um, collaboration, the art students and the media students did an activity whereby they had to visually illustrate different words like double or shadow, smile, and students who never even met each other physically were sharing through the medium of photography different creative interpretations. So we're trying to encourage them using this tool to communicate with staff members and their peers as well. As an example of students sort of problem solving the way out of a tight spot using Google Hangouts, just making sure they're in the loop for each other, figuring things out. So we use Hangouts pretty much every day as we do Google Classroom as well. Sorry. So I've got a slightly different perspective on marketing oh, wow. about the reputation of the college. It makes me quite nervous you're basically opening yourself up in a lot of public ways and having these very cooperative debates mm -hmm. online and that kind of thing. How do you control that? Because we, we struggle with just having one college Twitter and it's kind of a few sometimes we get through that. Um, it makes me nervous. People tweeting at the official at one. The really? Yeah. Really? And Facebook as well. Yeah. We, we, we have to moderate our Facebook page so heavily because some, some of the sexist, racist, homophobic, Things that we get posted to the college page. Perhaps it's just us. It's <laughs> just us, but yeah, who, we get posted. It's not all in the public and students. Yeah. I mean, the classrooms obviously is no problem, isn't it? Yeah. There's discussions in the groups, but just sort of having those very public channels that aren't really that personal debated or controlled. So we had the only time it's gone wrong, in truth, is the, when we did a cross college, ironically, cross college debate okay. between. QMC, Queen Mary's College, our rivals, and uh, Basing Stuck College Technology. And hashtag BCOP QMC was about Trump and Hillary. And um, I said, no, between their media teacher and me, I said, oh, this is brilliant, let's just do it. It'll be other students are debating about um, what they think. And um, I got cyberbullied, I got straight up cyberbullied by me. Um, they called me Emo Wanker. I didn't know I was Emo, but I'm um, Emo Wanker. Like, emo Wanker. And, and they're calling us. Um, Thick, and they called us autistic, like that was a put down, bizarre, bizarre. Anyway, um, they didn't realize that I was a teacher because got a young, trendy haircut. And, I was, <laughs> and, in, and in, my, in my profile picture, I was in the distance, you can't quite see my wrinkles, and it looked, looked quite young. So they thought I was just a student joining in the debate. When they found out I was a teacher, 
Um, and I, I, they went low and we went high. Every time they made a dig at us, we just said, um, really sorry to put you out. Have a really nice day. Just, I was role modeling to my students how you deal with trolls. And like, you turned it into a lesson, I suppose. Every time they went low, I just went high saying, I'm really utterly ashamed to put, ruin your day, sir. Have a lovely afternoon, love and kisses, just being nice to them. Every time they were really mean to me. And my students quite liked the fact that I was trying to just make light of these silly billies. Anyway, their principal found out about it and they got kicked out of college for a couple of weeks <laughs> because they were being so mean and nasty in, and using the QMC tag on it. Left it in marketing we've had in years at our college because their students were being mean and horrible, whereas <laughs> ours were being really professional because I like to think of our digital induction where we ingrained in them, your digital reputation will help or haunt you forever. Yeah. Forever. And we ingrained that from the get-go. And I was really proud of that. None of our students swore. They were all professional. And every time they went low, we went high. And we just role models, role models, role models them. Because <laughs> students don't get that role modeling from their teachers enough, I don't think. Really we can amazing. share with you what we've got. Holly is literally yeah. writing with the team at the moment. So we'll and use Classroom, don't you? So potentially we could even share a post with you which you yeah. could then reuse. And it's something we're always worried about is getting students involved on their personal social media accounts because you know, there isn't that possibility quite yet. But there's always going to be the students but, and then starting afresh with students yeah. something that's linked to their yeah. learning would be quite amazing. I think we should do it. I mean, in terms of, look, employers are going to look at their social media. That's the opening line for digital induction. Employers are going to look at your social media. They are literally first thing they do when they get that CV is type in your name. And it's a picture of you womanising with a beer helmet on and chance say you won't make it to the interview. If you just make it explicit to them. When I was employing our digital team, Sky and Holly, literally Facebook first thing, see that Sky's really socially conscious, she's on it, she's really nice, really pleasant, really creative, pretty much got her job. Um, showing them how it can be used positively. But the students come to us with negative content about social media and how it's a completely separate tool to education. Whereas in actual fact, it's the best toolkit in the history of education, if it's used well, I think. But that's where we are. It's our digital team's job to sort of bridge that gap. And it's difficult, I do appreciate it. And is it built up into recruitment in a way, like the stuff the students can do to use that then yeah. to try and recruit? Yeah, absolutely. I've got a marketing apprentice. Um, he's the number one on EduBank at the moment. You may know EduBank um, in terms of ranking social media in front of marketing teams. Um, he's 20, he's an apprentice, and he goes around to college constantly promoting, retweeting what's going on, constant uh, mark, um, window into the classrooms, what people are doing. So on Instagram in particular, big between 13, 14, 15 year olds, they can see what's going on in every classroom before they even come to their summer school activity. Um, in terms of publicity and marketing, it's an absolute gold mine. Um, in terms of um, recruitment figures as well, it's helped some areas. Public services, their numbers are incredible this year. In downturn, in terms of low birth year, public services, their social media is so good. And their numbers are that much higher because they're just always showing the cool things they're doing. Um, there's, there's no coincidence there. Yeah. Anything else to anybody? Is there any questions about something? Uh, Specifically, one about Google Classroom, actually. Yeah. Um, Stephen Gore had mentioned this, which I think is really interesting. Sorry if you didn't say this already. But in terms of coming out of Moodle, and I can't stand Moodle, in terms of coming out of Moodle, which we're, we're definitely doing this year, um, and then using Google Classroom, um, there may be a really simple way of doing this, but obviously, one of the main things is that you, for, for Moodle, you've got a kind of area where you can put main documents, handbooks, project briefs, etc., etc. So it's like a resource. Yeah, key yeah, sort of things to bulk a bit. Yeah, that's why I'm kind of No, no, you're the one that was so saying, it, and you were saying that but the, the thing is in Google Classroom's office, is it's a live stream. Mm -hmm. So if you put a document like saying this is called handbook, it disappears down the street. It does, but if you use the topics right here. Right. So, for example, let's just say that you're doing outcome one mm -hmm. for uh, an essay for a particular unit, um, and it gets to May, and she wants to resubmit that or revisit that rather than go through this noisy stream, they can just. Mm -hmm go straight up to that assignment brief, or even make a topic called assignment briefs. Um, using topics is a perfectly good way to do that. Right. Alternatively, in the, 
Um, sorry? The chronological, like whatever you put on there for an Yeah, I believe so. I believe that's quite Yeah, also the About tab, any key resources like the calendar, scheme of work, things that can be needed all year, stick it in the About tab. And you can link directly to posts that you've done in the past if you just get that link. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to, not, it's not just today that we're going to be sort of chatting to you. Hopefully this will go on indefinitely. We'll be available to just message any email, any questions. We want to collaborate with all of you forevermore, really. So we just, we want to feel less alone. We want to connect with people. So please don't feel like you are putting us out by sending a message six months from now going, what was that thing? Please, we really want to collaborate. But the about tab and the topics, is one of the best ways to do that we found. Um, we tend to uh, have community discussions over here, so one of projects. Yes, that's your way to do That's why some areas just want to use one classroom for everything, you just use topics really well. Uh, it's whatever works best for you. So, ask me something about uh, maybe something people are worried about. I know we get this lot of blended learning that people think is going to be too much on technology. And we uh, don't see things like that. Has that been your experience with the blended learning? Is it the right place to us? Um, it's, the staff are still accountable for it. They're, they're just learning. It's a new way of learning, just a different way of learning, essentially. So, um, all these those top 10 best lessons of the year, they're still doing it. They're just not in the actual physical space. They can come in and visit and be there if they want, but many of them are off prepping, doing other things. Um, but they are their contact hours. They've got one less contact hour per that per group, as it were. But that frees them up to do other things. We found, uh, which many of them have seen the benefit of as the years gone on. Um, so if they're using digital team effectively and collaborating, co-design with us, then they're freeing up time for them to actually innovate and find new things and to use their time more effectively. 10% of every course is quite a chunk. And if it isn't used well, then when it comes to June, July, you really feel the squeeze. And the areas that uh, sports have done really well, use blended learning incredibly well, and they're timely completion, good results. If you haven't used it well, then what's happening in blended learning is they've used that for a catch up workshop, which is fine. You can use it for that if you want. This is the most meaningful, fun way to use that hour. So are the teams still getting the hours then off of their? They're still claiming the hours. I think so. I think that's correct. Yeah. Okay. I believe so. Um, I'm a, in terms of, I don't, I'm not SMT to be honest with you, so I'm okay. not too sure in terms of how that equates. I can find that out. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah, because, I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, I can see the, the brilliance of setting it up for a year and giving teams time to play and do with that, and then launching it. My concern, I think, which was what you were kind of alluding to, was. For someone who's not particularly digitally literate like me, mm. for 36 weeks doing that every week, that's going to be quite a challenge. Yeah, we found that for a lot of people, yeah. you're not alone. But what's important in that context is just going, I need some help here, we'll do it. If, mm. if you were to, in that scenario, give us your spec and mm. say, right, I've got these two outcomes here, I really want to get those two outcomes covered in the blended learning, then Holly would go, oh, right, we could do a website for that, we can make a graphic, mm. we can make a video, we could just do it as an essay. And you co-design with the digital team member to do that. I think in the past, though, here it's been an additional duty as rather than part of our um, contact time. So that's where the challenge has been. Yeah. It's just been an additional thing to do. I see. So I it would be interesting yeah. to see what happens um, see at your sure college. Well. We'll 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 school. Mm. We'll we'll I mean, if it was part of what we have as directors, that would be one thing. Core hours. That's a completely different thing. Absolutely. This is guided learning hours. Even does count as GLH still. It does mm. have, it goes part of that. So that yeah, answers if, your question. If it, if it goes to the students' hours, that's one thing. If it goes to the teachers' hours, I that's see. A I'll find out. That's a really so, good question. I don't know the answer yeah. to it. It's been this review. So we have sessions here with people, some director and director, so we have to be set the students' works too, and they work in the way you all want to work in their classrooms for them. But you know, teachers have. But to have access to digital specialists, well, so they they because in yeah, terms of like holiday yeah. gifting of pastoral care and attention, like travel and tourism girls in particular, sort of 
they thought of Holly. Um, and they started off the year not knowing anything about digital things at all. They were making websites and using Google Maps and things, talking to Holly um, in a really affectionate way. And they were really happy in the learner survey because they had that relationship with a facilitator, an actual human, to put a face on what could have been this remote, distant thing. Um, that's been really crucial, having great facilitators. We've been very lucky. That's adapting our library staff, really, as part of the way we've done that, I suppose. Especially about digital readers, because that's something we're very much going to try and do next year. And um, could you just talk about you know how you initially recruited them and what their initial brief was and what what, what you how you pitched it to them and what you and how that how you went about building that team. So teaching media, I had access to some quite already really competent, brilliant, bright, uh, um, savvy practitioners but as I mentioned earlier on um, they weren't necessarily good at helping teachers so it's a case of getting people like Holly who are patient calm and nice and um, wouldn't freak teachers out if you get someone who's really sort of um, fast talking and borderline condescending talking about all the things they know about apps and social media it might put staff off but finding people who often course reps prefect style characters um, we've found in the creative subjects such as media, games development, uh, fashion, arts, computer science tended to be the main area or the who applied for the actual role. Um, in terms of interviews, to streamline the process, I just met with them and said to them, um, what are you into? What sort of things? Can show, show me, teach me one app, or teach me how to do one thing. And from that, I could gauge pretty quickly, you know, you're, you're a little bit short, short in terms of your patience and your little bit mean or you spoke to me. <laughs> so if you like that with me now, how are you going to be with someone who's le less uh, quick, I suppose, to understand what you're talking about? But that was a good quick acid test, I think, on that Wednesday. Just meet with people and say, oh, just show me something cool. Show me something you're into. And that instantly I could get a read on them. I haven't always been right, but a couple have been wrong. That's uh, sort of politely saying, time to my separate ways. But, but teaching teachers, they can say they've taught teachers on their CV. If they can say the academic reference from me saying they've done that, get a free lunch. They also get paid now in the second year, by the way, five hours per week and pay them. That's six quid an hour. Um, um, then they tend to sort of really want that role of certain characters. So you've had to sort of um, interview the right people and get a by trial and error we've got there. But empathy and emotional intelligence is paramount for anything else. That's something I've learned this year, to be honest with you. And they do that alongside their studies? That's correct. They get each um, student, as part of their program of study, needs to do 35 hours of work experience and 35 hours of enrichment. So this covers 35 hours of work experience, certainly, um, and enrichment as well, arguably. So it, they get their work experience and they get paid, and it's in the same college where they're studying anyway, so it's quite enviable for some of them to get it. Any other questions from anybody else? Well, I've spoken so much, I've never spoken this much in like <laughs> years and so. Weird. Anything, anything to add about um, how it's gone down with short courses and adults? Yeah, that's a really good question, mate. Um, unfortunately, because they're sessional part-time staff in the evenings, it's difficult to get to them and train them on inset days. Or when we have worked in like the counselling course in particular, I love Google Classroom. It's the adult learners on demand, on their device, in between picking the kids up and doing their part-time job and their other things. Yeah, the idea they can just work on drive, submit things remotely, really, really positive feedback from the council. Digital induction. Digital induction I did in the evenings with them because they weren't there for the in the week. So I just stayed late a couple of nights a week and did it with them. Um, so they did the same digital induction with um the, like you don't have many such courses to deal with. Like seven or eight, um, in truth. Um, next year they'll probably double that, so I'll be staying late a bit yeah, more yeah. next year. Apologies, access courses. Um, a short course, I suppose it's um, an equivalent thereof. Um, yes, they did the same thing, digital induction. Um, what was your experience working with access this year? Um, it's the same thing, they're not quite positive with it. A lot of them come in thinking I'm not really very good at tech, it, whatever it's there, but especially that with them, it's not of a slower approach with them, but they really appreciate again, the team and how we work. Um, um, and a lot of them come away here not more confident about them. the students. Uh, the students, yeah. Um, but a lot of it has also been around uh, new characters and referencing, 
Okay. One more thing might be useful um, in terms of using YouTube this year. It's been it's been quite useful for a lot of courses in terms of getting students to make playlists of um, different videos that they found useful in terms of educating each other. That's been quite a nice sort of flipped learning approach. They can create playlists and share it in the classroom with one another. What's also been useful is getting the students to present the assignment briefs themselves and say what they need to do. Um, me screencasting myself talking through an assignment brief and um, saying what they need to do as well. Um, that way the students can comment on YouTube underneath any further questions. So in terms of putting this in their Google Classroom, it's a nice way to sort of enable them to revisit and rewind and replay the instruction remotely from their instructor. But getting the students to present it themselves or getting myself to just screencast and record what I'm doing has been quite a useful way of collaborating with my students. Um, third party videos are good, but the students always respond more when it comes from their team. Even if it's just me doing a ropey video on my phone quickly, um, they find that a bit more immediate and meaningful than just something I've just found on YouTube and shared with them out of context. Any other questions at all? Anything else? Can you just you mentioned LinkedIn? What do you do? Is it that you basically? Oh, sorry, mate. I forgot about that, didn't I? Over there. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, apologies, I forgot to go back to that. Um, so LinkedIn, um, what we found really useful with this is when they start the course, um, we get to make a LinkedIn profile. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with LinkedIn, the fourth biggest social network in the world, Facebook for professionals, essentially. Here's my apprentices here, um, competing on LinkedIn to get the most amount of endorsements and recommendations. So I asked them, so at the end of each unit, we do a unit together, it might be graphics, it might be video, it might be critical thinking or photography. After each unit, we go on LinkedIn and then assess each other. And we can endorse each other's skills. Some of you use Microsoft Word really well, give them a little endorsement. So straight away, they become a bit more employable to the wider world for using that skill. Um, you can Photoshop well, photography, and they can talk, gamify the learning process. At the end of each task, they sidle up to each other nervously and say, was I good in that teamwork task? And just try to get that little you know, point. Um, it's an online CV and calling card to employers. So again, just beyond the course, always preparing them for what happens next. Um, making them conscious that digital reputation all the way through the course as well, something we're really sort of trying hard to do. Networking with professionals as well, getting to find people they admire, or better yet, someone who's got the job that they want, and just connect with them. Try your luck. Message them going, I love what you're doing. Your stuff's really cool. Can I have work experience? Just reaching out, connecting, using social media in a professional way is what we try to do. Interesting about Instagram, actually. Uh, sorry, about LinkedIn. Was, uh, I was talking to Nigel there, a couple of you got a lot of charity, about getting more feedback to the students, actually. Uh, so they can use it on their website. So I'm getting all the students to start to have a LinkedIn account where they can endorse each other, you can endorse them, but also employers that they can work with. You can even make that kind of a condition if they want to endorse them. That's, that's a really good idea, I think. What I do is after each unit, if they get a distinction, I give them a recommendation on LinkedIn. So if they do it really well, then not only do they get a distinction, I professionally, forever, online, have said, this person can do this really well. Rubber stamp it. That way, it's, it's, it makes it, it's, it's, for some of them, they find that legitimacy quite rewarding. That's how um, I've heard one person phrase it. So yeah, it's quite, not quite useful. Um, using docs as well as um, lecture notes as well, I found that really interesting, particularly like this, I suppose, in quite a wordy lecture. Um, having a doc as a back ch um, channel to the lecture and having them sort of talk in a shared document is quite useful. That way, what does Scott mean by that word there? Or what does this mean? And rather than stop the flow of the lesson, they can, as a Google Doc in the background, have this document to go back to as a revision aid. So using Google Docs for that reason is quite useful, we found, actually. Now, this is something we did this year using Google Slides, um, asking them to tell a story um, using 20 slides, I think it was, demonstrating three narrative theories from media, um, and using Google Drawings. So they photographed each other, imported pictures into Google Slides, and 
used captions and told a story. This can be used like health and social care users to do health and safety related activities and showed their learning through a shared Google Slides deck. They did it all themselves. I didn't do any of this. They just um, I showed them the tools and they figured it out themselves. It was a really good collaborative activity. It's quite fun. In terms of doing that cross college or something um, between different subject areas might be quite effective as well. Sharing a slide deck and having it populated with different viewpoints could do that. Sorry. Um, I'm interested in exploring just sweet more as we're using it here and students are using it even as well. Um, and I haven't used Facebook yet, I'm a little bit cautious about it. I didn't have students, it's not any use to Facebook. <laughs> and uh, whether I can use Google for that. What about the um, communities? And, yeah, we tried. I mean, for people yeah. like myself and Jim, G Suite um, loving uh, educators is great. Students don't tend to like it so much. And I've used I've used pretty much I've used most things. I've used Google Plus twice with my students, and they haven't liked it. Even on our team, we tried it, and we just went. Uh. Yeah. It's a bit of, uh, there's a hesitance from it from back when uh, Google Plus was still quite new. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be so yeah. neat as a solution, but we found that using Hangouts and Google Sites as a place then mm -hmm. to put their responses, yeah, unfortunately, it isn't the most elegant solution, but I'm sure maybe I just haven't done it right yet. I haven't cracked it, to be honest with you. I've tried, but no. Nice, good. We're doing, yeah, we're currently working with the English and Maths guys at Beacon. We're making comedy sketches of them, how English and Maths matters on YouTube, which is so good to get you guys doing that with us as well, actually. Yeah, definitely. Please, let's definitely do that. That'd be cool. We're making websites on beacotmaths.com and beacotenglish.com, where we're putting all games and resources for people to access throughout the academic year. So, yes, we've got um, some hopefully good ideas. As I say, we're not precious about anything, yeah. we will share everything. We're, we're twice as strong if we do that. Um, in FE, it's survival right now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to buddy up with each other regardless of our allegiances and thrive. That's what I really want to do. I mean, I love the idea of having things through other things like podcasts and things like that. Can't I just do that? They have to produce something. Yeah, well, so, it's so frustrating because sometimes some of you are like they can demonstrate a soliloquy or a monologue, you know. So you said somebody from your college, and that was using health and social care, um, and she differentiated so vastly, giving them opportunities to vlog and podcast their responses. Yeah, that's something the media have been doing for years, but our subject lends itself. We should be the guinea pigs to try these things out and then feed it back to you, is how I see it. Um, and it works. It works. Oh, my feedback now is all podcast and vlogs. So I don't write feedback anymore. I know. I know. There's still room for innovation, though. Please. I think what I was suggesting is that maybe you can sort of set up a like spreadsheet or Google Doc where if anyone wants to buddy up with their parents, yes, uh, please, that'd be great. You put, your, you put your email address in your subject area, mm -hmm. we like to do this, and they'll all share that. So you can things that is one thing that you know, I mean, just in this connection I've made, it's got to just start, start to do how you work with it. It's going to be a huge loop, and obviously, we've got our counterparts. And Yes, right pretty much well, course for so course, yeah. Made three -way collaboration. Mm -hmm. no, it's great when I, we, we were some here in the webinar we did a couple years ago on social media as well. Oh, right. Oh, right. We never really took on that webinar. Please, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Love that. Nice one. Hey, anybody else help with anything else? That's all. Let's hear me talk a bit more. <laughs> 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 Well, I could send an email out to everybody that was on the invitation list. Let's have a quick chat about how yeah. to facilitate this, yeah. you know, this uh, meeting of minds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, teaching how.
Great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. 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 Thank you.